So in our last session, I have introduced a new model, say a bigger model, a hybrid model, building on top of our stochastic forward rate model. We are now modeling uh, stochastic credit spreads or uh, taking a different view, um, a stochastic defaultable forward rate that follows an independent stochastic process you know, so that may have its own uh, Brownian drivers. So let, let us quickly go through this. So we were looking here at a defaultable bond. And the first issue we had is that the defaultable bond has a discontinuous part. It can jump down to, to zero. Uh, so it was not so clear how, how should we model this. And a very nice thing is that we split the discontinuous part that is here, this default indicator function from the process. So we have a continuous part. So this is here our P superscript D star. This is the continuous part, uh, which follows an E2 process. And then we have the discontinuous part. Um, for this continuous part, we then defined a pseudo forward rate in the same way as we did for the non-defaultable bond. Yeah, So the ratio of the bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end, divided by the bond at the end, divided by the uh, period length. So that's here this uh, guy. And then the defaultable bond is actually built up by taking the product of over these guys, well, one divided by, uh, and the short period bond that also contains the discontinuous part. Okay, so that was our model setup. Then came the question, what is the drift of these forward rates? So what is here the drift of this guy under our measure uh, QN? And we were going the same lines as we did before. So we were looking at products divided by the numeraire that should be martingales under our uh, measure. So the defaultable bond divided by the numeraire is a martingale. And you see again here the splitting continuous part, this continuous part when we applied that. And in the derivation then it was um, quite nice. We observed that L times defaultable bond divided by the numeraire is also a martingale. And then applying Ito's lemma, we got these three guys. The drift of L will pop out here. And there is a covariance term popping out here. And this guy is a martingale, so it doesn't have a DT. Um, so for that guy, there was a little thing different uh, um, because you see that we have here the differential on this short period bond divided by the numeraire in the model where we look at the non-defaultable bond, this guy is vanishing. And here it actually contains the jump part. But luckily we are multiplying this guy with a DL, our synthetic forward rate, and the DL is a continuous uh, is an ETO process, continuous part. So we multiply this jump part with a continuous part and we have the, where was that here? And we have the fact that for an ETO process X and a jump process J, DX, DJ is uh, zero. Such that in this derivation, we could derive the drift and suddenly the drift looks like as we had just the model with the continuous part. There is, however, at some point popping out a drift term related to the uh, DJ, um, because if we go back, that's a bit subtle. Uh, that's a bit subtle, because if we go back to this slide, uh, argument was that this guy here is a martingale, so it has no DT, but actually 
inside this, this is the, the defaultable bond, there's the jump part. And to compensate the jump part, there has to be a compensator. So actually the, the default intensity lambda times dt is the compensator. And um, that's still inside the model. But uh, for the other terms, the jump part was not relevant because we were multiplying with, um, ah, no, it's not this slide, this, uh, it's, yeah, it's uh, the, uh, yeah, it is, it is okay. Okay, but in this argumentation, it was not relevant, relevant because we are multiplying this, um, uh, these guys here uh, with a uh, with an, uh, DL, yeah? so the jump part will will vanish. So we we got a very nice um, expression here for the drift, the continuous part, and then it was left open. Uh, so how do we now model the jump part? And the jump part is already implied by our modeling of the defaultable forward rate, and of course the non-defaultable forward rate. Because we have this relation between the default intensity, or if you take the exponential, exponential of minus this, it is the survival probability. So the definition of the survival probability is related to the ratio of the two bonds. So you see that our jump process should be a jump process that somehow is related to this um, intensity. Yeah? So you know the intensity is um, actually the expected number of jumps in a certain time interval. So that was a little recap of what we did. So our model is now completely described. And now we have the question, how do we implement this? And this is also again a little bit interesting because you can do things more complicated and in an inefficient way and you can do it in an efficient way and um, also what, what i really like is that if you know the implementation you sometimes have a much deeper knowledge of the model because sometimes if people ask me things you know, i just uh, think okay how is it in the implementation which quantity does depend on which quantity so so looking at an implementation also sometimes helps to understand the model and maybe that's that's a good thing about this session so um we like to do a monte carlo simulation so we have two uh say e2 processes so this is of course our non-defaultable forward rate we have different such forward rates so we have the process for this guy and yeah now you can look at the spread if you like to simulate the spread we motivated that it's maybe nicer to simulate the credit spread because then the intuition for volatility and correlation is maybe much nicer you can specify the volatility of the difference um, and you can specify the volatility of the base curve yeah? So maybe that's not nicer, but for writing down the stochastic processes or for deriving the drift, the formulation with the default forward rate was nicer. So we have these two continuous stochastic processes, these two OETO processes, and we just know how to do this. How to do this? We just use um, an Euler scheme. Okay, so we have these two stochastic processes. Uh, and um, we wrote down the stochastic process for our non-defaultable rate. Um, it's just a general ETO process. So we have here a volatility coefficient, but I already mentioned that this is maybe just a short notation and you could have a log normal process where you have an LI in front here. Uh, so that's just part of the definition of the sigma. And then, of course, you could also use uh, a log Euler scheme yeah, because you know the sigma will appear also in the drift. So there will also be an Li here. Uh, um, and you can move to a log um, Euler scheme. There is a small subtle point. Yeah, and 
maybe you have spotted it, but I haven't highlighted it. Um, I wrote the stochastic process for the S here as one with a log normal diffusion. So you could immediately think, okay, let's assume a log normal process for the spread and uh, use the log Euler scheme discretization. But if you go back to the drift, we have derived the drift for the defaultable forward rate, and then we can calculate the drift for the spread yeah, by taking the difference, the difference of the drift of the defaultable forward rate minus the mu. And you see uh, the, there are four terms in the covariance of the spread, you know, all the covariance between the parts, yeah, interspread, interforward rate, and the two cost terms. And then you have minus the covariance term related to the forward rate. Yeah? So we, you get only three guys, but the minus is not exactly canceling the last part. Yeah? So there's something left over. So that was the, the little bit ugly looking um, formula for the spread. And while it is the case that if you have a log normal diffusion, so you have an L sigma dW, there will be an L in front uh, of the drift because you always have the term sigma i, sigma j rho i j in the diffusion term. If you do this splitting, it is not guaranteed that you have in the drift of mu i always an si. Yeah? So there is the si here, there's the si here, but here there's only the sj and also here we have an S, sj. Yeah? So I cannot move the SI in front. So it's not clear if the drift has also the form SI times something. And the reason is also obvious. Uh, if you go to a log normal LI and you would like to have a log normal LD, uh, the sum of two log normals is maybe not log normal. Okay, So it's not so clear. Um, how, how this thing uh, looks like. And that's a subtle point. And for that reason, I'm a bit cautious here and I write it in this form. Yeah? So you have to check your, your, your model assumptions a bit. But apart from, from this, I mean, you can just use an Euler scheme with a fine time stepping. Yeah? And maybe that's even not an issue if you just model it in a non-log Euler scheme. And apart from that, uh, it's clear how to do the Monte Carlo simulation of these guys. So we, so we will model our non-default forward rate and our spread in a Monte Carlo simulation. So maybe if you'd like to draw a picture, you have here the evolution of time. And now I have a spread curve and a forward rate curve. So I just draw maybe one value. So here I have the evolution of the forward rate. Okay, and that's the forward rate. And somewhere down there, I have maybe the evolution of the spread because now the spread is the stuff that comes on top. Okay, you could also model the defaultable forward rate. So maybe the defaultable forward rate is then the sum of the two. Yeah, so you have the guys lying around here. So you can also model now the defaultable forward rate, which is the sum of the two, which is now maybe here lying around here. So that's L, L superscript D and S. And we just do a Monte Carlo simulation and we can uh, calculate the defaultable bond, the non-defaultable bond and so on. So that's clear how we do it. So now we have the indicator process, the jump part. And how do we do this? Okay, so if we have our time discretization, say our simulation time discretization, we can now write the default indicator process. So this is here our J. Yeah? So it jumps to one 
at the default time. So one minus this guy jumps to zero after default or at default. And um, if I have this time discretization, so let me draw the time discretization. I can just look at the default uh, probability or the survival probability uh, in one of our time intervals. So I have the default indicator function for this time interval. So is tau is my default time. So here maybe I have default. This is tau of omega. Yeah. Uh, is this lying in this um, interval? Yeah, and the indicator for the whole period up to Ti. So Ti is now here the end point. It's of course just the product of the default indicator as well. This is um, one minus is jumping to zero. It's just the product of one minus default indicator um, of that interval. So I can decompose the default indicator into these small indicators for each interval. And then I know that the probability distribution of this default indicator is that we have survival. So, um, wait, is this, is this uh, the other way around? Let me shortly think. Um, yeah, you agree, yeah? <laughs> Okay, let me fix the typo. Okay, so I see there is, I believe, a typo. Yeah, um, the def this is the default indicator. So one, if tau is inside the interval, so it means I'm defaulting in the interval, but exponential minus is the survival probability that I will survive this interval. One minus is the default probability. So it's actually here the other way uh, around. Yeah, so that's a typo. So let's have a zero here and a one here. Is that right? Yeah, because I'm just multiplying all the um, exponentials for the survival probability. Oh, and I see there's another typo. Huh? So I'm sorry for that. The thing that I have written here is jumping to zero after default, but my J was defined that it's jumping to one after default yeah, because in the, in the, uh, the splitting of the, um, processes, I had a one minus J for the process that jumps to zero. So there should also be a one minus J here. Okay, so I believe now the slide is fixed. Yeah? So maybe you can, you can check it again. But anyway, the idea is maybe clear. Yeah, So you know the survival and the default uh, probability for each small interval because this quantity is just related to our defaultable and non-defaultable zero copper bonds, which we can derive from our model um, for this finer time discretization. So if this, fine, this time discretization is finer, we need this interpolation assumption yeah, for the stochastic processes. If the small t agrees with the large t, so agrees with the tender discretization, then we have it immediately from our forward rates. So now I have the default um, indicator. So now comes an interesting point. We can now just simulate these default events by doing a second um, random number generation on the simulation paths that we have for, for the continuous part. And then just determine uh, the default time. So where is the time? And 
then just stop the simulation path at that point. So that idea would look as follows. So here is the time horizon of our model. So maybe I just simulate now the defaultable forward rate. So I simulate the defaultable forward rate, my continuous part over the whole time period. Then I generate the default time. And those who have followed the numerical method lecture, there was a small session on how to do this. So you have an exponential distribution. So you um, simulate first or you generate first a uniform distributed random number, and then you apply the inversion of the distribution function to get the time. And uh, here I have um, an exponential distribution with a piecewise constant intensity. So maybe you have to check a little bit where the time is. Yeah, you can go from, from the starting time to the end time and just see if the accumulated uh, distribution already has reached the number that you have drawn and then you have found the default time. So anyway, just as a black box, you can now generate maybe the default time and some path will default earlier, some path will default later. So you have on each sample path at default time. So I generate one additional random number for each sample pass. And note that my sample pass is already a vector of 40 numbers, namely the 40 forward rates. Uh, actually 80 numbers, the 40 forward rates, non-defaultable and the 40 spreads. Yeah? So something like that. So one additional entry in my vector is the default time. And then you can take the view that your sample pass is just stopping at this point. Huh? So I'm defaulting at that point. So now the picture maybe looks like that, that we are just simulating to this end here. And the remaining part is well not existing in my model. It was just for the formulation of the uh, equation to have it yeah, more easy. Okay, so that's the idea. So if this here is the path omega, then this here is the tau of omega. Huh? So this here is the tau of omega. <coughs> Uh, however, this is very inefficient and it's possible to do this much more um, efficient. And to see this, let's have a look how we would now value a financial product that is has uh, an association to default. Yeah, So that is either has a defaultable payoff or has um, some special condition uh, on default. So of course you can just value this financial product with this information. You, know, you have all the information here. So let's consider maybe a special case. So I have some payoff. So this is paid here, a defaultable quantity. So payment is in time ti plus one. So maybe at the end of the period or something like that, it's a coupon uh, xi paid at the end of the period. And my guy consists of three parts. So this here is the part that I'm paying independent of default. Uh, so this here is, uh, so I'm always paying xi zero, uh, xi superscript zero. Uh, so it could be zero. Yeah? So then it's just a pure defaultable payoff. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, otherwise uh, you, you, can, you can compose that there is some additional payment. For example, it could be a recovery or whatever. Then I have a defaultable part. So I'm paying xi superscript D, but only if I have survived, and now you could say uh, it's the fixing or it's the um, 
payment time. Yeah, let's take here the payment time. So this is um, paid if I survive. So this is the defaultable. This is a defaultable payoff. So I paid that only if I have survived until the end of the period. And you can also add a third guy so that something that is paid if you are if you have default inside uh, the period. Yeah? So, and maybe from all these three cases, yeah, you can uh, com very generally compose your uh, payoff. Of course, this thing here is only depending on the information if default has happened in the period, before the period or after the period, yeah, you can combine all the three things. You do not know, it does not know, uh, it does not depend exactly on the time within the period. That can be also discussed, yeah, but often uh, these, um, these, these conditions are just evaluated at specific dates. So how would we now value this uh, financial product? So we have everything at hand. We have our numerair. So we would divide the payment by the numerair. So just take the VD at TI plus one, divided by the numerair at payment time. And then we need to take the expectation of this object, well, conditional two. Okay, and now comes um, already yeah, um, a thing that has to be done a little bit more precise yeah, from the mathematical point of view. What is your filtration? So maybe I have here a filtration H so now I take conditional to time zero. So let's take H T zero. And the filtration H is actually composed of the information I have conditional to non-default. So that's the filtration F that is generated by the Brownian motions. So this is my continuous part, my continuous sample path. But then you know that on my continuous sample path, I have the probability to go on and I have the probability to default. So there is an additional information. Did I have default? This in additional information is this, uh, if you think in, in, in implementation, is this um, additional random number you're generating. The additional random number that decides whether you default with the probability or not. And this random number is of course not in this set of random numbers. Yeah. So filtration is, uh, you can, you can, if you think of an implementation, uh, I, I'm just in a discrete space, you can just identify it with the sequence of random numbers you have generated. Do you have knowledge about these random numbers? So there is um, an additional part. So I have, oops. So I have the continuous part, the F, and I have times the default part. So I have maybe some G that contains the information, did I default or did I not default? Okay, so you have to take the expectation with respect to this, um, enlarged filtration. But if the value that is paid here is only depending, and that's general the case. Yeah? So for example, a coupon, a forward rate or whatever, if that value is only depending on the continuous part, just the function of the continuous parts. So functions here of our model primitives, yeah, then the probability of default or the dependence on the default is contained here just in these conditions. 
So, and you can now split like a tower law, this um, expectation into two steps. You can first take the expectation with respect to the default probability. So I get this, whoops. So I get this with probability one, I get it always. I get this with probability exponential minus integral lambda from zero to ti plus one, because that's the probability that I survived up to this. Otherwise I get not this, I get zero. And I get this with probability one minus exponential integral from, sorry, one minus exponential minus integral from ti to ti plus one, yeah? because that's the probability that I default in this um, interval. Yeah, so you can just take the expectation of these three values by just multiplying with the three probabilities. So I can take out the inner expectation. So I can now define this probability so I use the dark blue for that guy, light blue for that guy. So this is the probability that I will default in the interval, given that I have survived up to uh, TI. It's just evaluating here the ratio of the zero copper bond, well, one minus. And this here is the probability that I survive up to TI or plug in a TI plus one. It's just the product of all these guys. And there is an interesting thing. Yeah? If you take now the product of all these one minus Q, you see this is just here the ratio of the zero copper bonds. Yeah, the ratio of the zero copper bonds is the probability to survive this interval. And if you take the product, you see that this is just our funny numerea divided by something which looks like a numerea for the defaultable uh, market. Yeah, uh, And we already saw this guy. It's um, a pseudo numerea. Um, it is the ND star, the numerea made up of the defaultable forward rates conditional to non-default. So you see that this survival probability is actually like a change of numerea, like um, a conversion rate in a cross-currency model. And the analogy is really strong. So the thing is that I now just simulate one additional quantity and maybe I'm not simulating the default time. I'm simulating here this additional numerea. And then I can express the probability to survive with the ratio of these numereas. And by taking different times here, I can of course also express the probability to default in the interval, yeah? I take a one minus. So I just simulate this additional quantity and I can now write the probabilities to the corresponding cash flows. So that is here the part that is always paid. That is the part that is paid if I survive the payment up to the payment time. And that is here the part that is paid if I default in the interval conditional to so surviving up to TI. So what I do is now I replace my payoff with this payoff, which means that I'm actually already doing one step in the evaluation. I'm performing the inner expectation with respect to the default information. And then I have a non-defaultable payoff. So in expectation, I pay this non-defaultable. 
And you can do that if your payment doesn't depend on, on the tau. Yeah? So it's just the if it is paid. I divide here everything by n of ti plus one because this stuff, yeah, this expected stuff is then paid in ti plus one. Uh, but now if you plug in the definition of the survival probability, so here of that guy that is related to the n d star numeraire, you see that here this numeraire is canceled and replaced with the defaultable numeraire. And this looks now a bit nice because you see that you pay this here relative to the non-defaultable numeraire and you pay the defaultable part relative to the defaultable numeraire. And if you have this other special payment that you have a special payment in the period depending on default, well, then it would look like that. And you can again, uh, combine the stuff a little bit. So you see that you have here a non-defaultable part and I have now a defaultable part that depends a little bit on the numerares, defaultable numeraire at the beginning of the period and at the end of the period. And all you, all you need is this additional defaultable numeraire. So now what I do is that in the evaluation of the financial product, I replace this um, payoff function where I would multiply the indicator. So going back to this picture, where I would have these red dots and suddenly I multiply always with a one and then bam, I multiply with a zero. I replace this indicator I replace this indicator with the probabilities. So I take the expectations. And this is really far more efficient because what we are now doing is the following. If we like to draw the picture again. So here's simulation time. Here's maybe the time horizon of the model. Then we have the sample path say of our defaultable and also now included in this non-defaultable forward rates. And then I walk on this sample path and I consider, okay, what is happening? What do I get if I continue? Or what do I get if I default? So, so now I do this consideration on every time step. So I can do it again at the next time step. So what do I get if I survive? And what do I get if I default? And I do it in the next time step again. So you have all the evaluation points up to the time horizon. And you can in each point consider the expectation, you take the expectation uh, on the default event branch. So here on our part G. So that, that means that instead of just considering a single point where default could happen, you are just now considering N possible default points by taking the corresponding probabilities. Yeah? So instead of simulating 1 million path, uh, I'm to some extent simulating 40 million path, simulation paths, if I have 40 time steps, because I'm simulating for each simulation path in F, I'm simulating all the possibilities in G because it really, it's really easy to evaluate what is happening in G. Yeah? So either you continue or you don't continue. So, and this, either you continue or don't continue. This is of course encoded that I have in all the payment, the conditional to that I have survived up to this time point, yeah? what, what's, what's happening. Okay, so this is a nice, a nice little trick. Yeah, how you would implement um, implement 
this model. And this is also very efficient. So all we need, yeah, so to encode this information is just a single scalar stochastic process, one additional state variable, which is here this other pseudo numeria. Yeah, okay, so that was the implementation. And um, many fi financial products yeah, just have a condition that something is paid if default has occurred or not occurred. Yeah, so there is no complicated function on the default time. Maybe um, a last um, remark, you can also model a cash flow that depends on the exact default time uh, well, then you know that you have an exponential distribution, an exponential distribution with intensity lambda. So here is the lambda inside. Uh, you know, the distribution function is the exponential minus integral lambda ds ds. Then the density of this distribution is lambda times. Yeah, so differentiate uh, with this. And you can integrate, of course, um, against this uh, density. Yeah? So if you now have some uh, payment that depends on, yeah, so where, where well, maybe the payment degrades over time, yeah, something like that, and de depends a little bit on the default time, then you can calculate the um, expect, expected payment, uh, the expected payment at the end time of the period. Also here discounted with, with um, a discount factor. So if we assume just that the short period bond, so this is a short period bond that we see here uh, is deterministic, yeah, then this is may be easy to calculate or to approximate this integral. Going back to the previous idea. Yeah, so again, you see that there is a strong analogy to a cross currency model. Yeah? So the analogy to the cross currency model is really strong here too. We already had this analogy with the um, trick where we replaced our numerea by some adjusted numerea. And now you see that we also have this adjusted numerea here, but now the adjusted numerea is made out of stochastic forward rates. So it's really very similar to what we already did for our model where we have an implementation where I check, is there a discount curve set? Yeah? Should I move to a different discounting curve and then adjust the numerator? And here I just can replace my numerator with this defaultable numerator. So which means that I multiply with the ratio of non-defaultable numerator, which is then canceling, divided by defaultable numerator which is that I, I multiply with the survival probability. So there is really a strong analogy to moving to a different numeraire, like I do moving to a different numeraire in a cross-currency model when I like to value a payoff in a foreign currency. So you know that valuing a payoff in a foreign currency, you can also move to the foreign currency numerea multiplied with the fx rate, uh, which is then your, um, uh, yeah, your uh, uh, numerea using the uh, foreign forward rates. And if the payoff pay is uh, converted to your domestic currency, the FX rate will cancel and you just divide by the foreign numeria. It's like evaluating in foreign currency. Huh? And a similar thing is, is happening here. So that's also a, a hint that you could maybe just use the same implementation for a cross currency model than for that model, except that now maybe there is another interpretation how you evaluate financial products. So 
going back to this. So uh, you have maybe a non-defaultable payoff part, which is your domestic currency payoff part. You have a defaultable payoff part, which is maybe your foreign payoff part. You know? And then there's also this special part where you maybe have a change to the currency inside the period. Okay, and this is how we would implement this. And now we are actually done.